we waited three more days until he returns. He says, well, we're going out of town now. Now you, we're going to have cover the windows and you'll, we'll give you glasses that, you know, sort of sent blindfolds, but they're not really, but we require to do it. So we get in this van, drive through the tunnel that leads to Kabul and stop at a side road that, that, that you could see led up a mountain. And there was another, there was a, there was another vehicle, a uh, all-terrain vehicle there, and uh, we got out of our car, and then a militia came out and searched us and questioned us about uh, who we were, what we were, and this guy's responding. And these guys had guns, and they and they patted our pockets. We had a look at the back and vehicle and said okay so by now it was getting getting dark and we start going up this rocky road just just terrible and the vehicles climbing it and later bin laden told me that he was very proud of it because he had built that road with his own heavy equipment that he shipped in from his father's uh, construction company during the russian war so <laughs> but anyway this road, so we keep going, and 20 minutes in, we're stopped again. And, it, and the 20 men come out with weapons and demanding we get out of the vehicle. And they're talking to the guide, but they're looking at us, patting us down. And the guide says, well, they're concerned that you may have tracking equipment somewhere. I said, what do you mean tracking equipment? Well, we knew what it was. It was... It was sort of button-like objects that could be focused on by any aircraft or, and could pinpoint the location of the person who's wearing it. And my thought was, at one point, I hope my stomach doesn't start to rumble because they may think I've swallowed one of these things. <laughs> I'm joking, but I thought it. How do you explain that you don't have tracking equipment that they couldn't have? But anyway, they said, if you have it and we find it, we will kill you. That's what they told us. Check with Peter Bergen. If you have it and we find it, we kill you. So we want to one more checkpoint. And then by 9.30 in the evening, we get to a little sort of clearing in the road and there was a, a couple of huts like shepherd's huts and there was a lot of soldiers there and there was moonlight a lot of soldiers hanging out we get out and they lead us to this little hut with a tattered carpet on the floor no seats and so they sit there and wait and this young man set up video equipment and we had allowed us to take lights thank god so we had well lit we had a we had a little generator because there was no electricity up there it was well lit and they had this camera and we're sitting there and waiting waiting what are we going to see and then bin laden comes in and i was struck by his height because not only is he tall but he had this hat so it was about seven foot up from toe to top, but in fact they said he's about 6'3 or 6'4, and he had a military jacket on, and he was carrying an AK-47 in his hand, and he was a fearsome-looking character, and he looked at us, and I went to get up. He says, oh, and I gestured to us to sit down, and he went and squatted on the by the wall and sort of indicated and it started. So they'd sent back the questions and uh, ruled out the ones that he didn't want to answer. So I started asking one question after the other. And there was a, the young man was uh, with us, it was translating it to some degree, but it was just a, a, an offhand translation. So I didn't really know what I was saying, but it didn't matter because he, he didn't allow follow-up questions, unlike Saddam, who allowed me to follow up, which I did in the for Saddam interview. But bin Laden, smart enough to not, to, so he'd make a statement and that statement stood, 
He didn't have to justify any questioning of it. Smart guy. So I asked one question after the other, and he was sitting there, and he was confident, and he would be sometimes an aunt talking about the American military. His face would screw up angrily. Other times he'd be serene, talking about Islam and the role of it, and then he'd get angry again. We asked him about, well, really important issues about you know, his view of uh, his view of the role of uh, you know, to what degree would he endeavor to uh, launch attacks upon and, uh, military installations in the in the Gulf state, the Gulf area, and in the in, along the Arabian Peninsula area, because there'd been two or three incidents, terrorist incidents against, against American shipping and in American barracks in Saudi Arabia. He didn't accept the fact that he he's claimed he didn't get involved in any of those, which we learned later he was. But he did lay claim to a, uh, let me say, a, a terrorism attack, and maybe one in Africa that had, that had happened, or I'll have to check. What, but he did say that we are in a position to do it, and when we, 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 we pick our targets carefully, then we, I, we had several questions about targeting. And when we asked him about what about American military targets, he says they are open to attack any time. They are enemies of the people. We reserve the right to attack them at any point in time, and we will attack them at any point in time. And so then another question as well, what about the American civilians in, who are living there amongst their soldiers? And they said, well, the American civilians come to our countries and with their soldiers who are attempting to you know, destroy our, our traditions in their sacrifice may be necessary. And then the other question, well, what about Americans in the United States? Would you ever think of attacking them? And he says, ah, the American people, they voted in this government that is present in our land. Their soldiers are here. The culture is here. They are as involved in attempting to, to abuse Islam, attempting to change Islam and destroy it, and they are as vulnerable and as, and as responsible as any soldier who is here. Uh, did I ask him, well, are you going to blow up the World Trade Center? <laughs> no, no. But that was the indication of the other... That was the, an important response. And would he negotiate with anyone in good faith? No. Well, actually, that question he didn't want to respond to. It was a, it was a pretty good interview. Now, it was an important interview, and they expected that they would see it in CNN in about a week's time. It took about four months and only a small portion ever appeared on CNN. Because like so many other documentaries, what you do, you interview people and you just use what the quotes that you want to use. And he was not happy with that. He was, we later read that he was complaining and his, see he communicated with his followers in the Arab world and the Arab communities in Europe with videotapes and audio tapes. So he was complaining that he kept waiting to see this great interview he'd given with CNN. What happened to the original well, interview? Well what, happened, well, what happened was that we got back, and, and uh, Bergen's idea was to include that, that they would discuss it. It's about bin Laden, but sort of you enter, talk about being a, such a dangerous guy, and you'd have a quote, this is why this guy's dangerous, and then you'd have stuff about what he may have done, and what. then you'd have another quote about this. But, you know, maybe six or seven quotes, but just a part of it. And then the other thing was it comes months later. So, but the, so in this kind of documentary, you know, you, this, is, this is television's wasteful use of uh, these, uh, these interviews. We did interview him. 
it was eventually shown on CNN and it portrayed him as a major danger to the U.S. And it was picked up. It didn't make any sensational reaction, but in no way would it have succeeded in being sensational because the public profile of bin Laden remained very low. This became more important after 9-11, where people were rushing to get a transcript of the interview. But the FBI knew about it. The CIA knew about it. They all, they'd seen the audio tape, the videotape. So the U.S. government knew about it. So it, he got his message through that way. But in terms of reaching an international audience with his, it, was, it, it didn't really succeed. 